I could not resist the lure of my alma mater, so it became a Leiden University Press book, but the publicity and distribution of it is managed by AUP. This close cooperation between these presses was both Saskia's and my wish, and I hope that in the future an ever closer cooperation between them will come into being, certainly in the field of Asian studies. Also, AUP, a pioneer of open access publishing, must surely have inspired LUP to engage in open access publications. I do not doubt that it is the way forward, and I'm more than happy that my book has been published in this format, because so it became accessible to all for free. Over the years, I witnessed many lectures in this conference room on a variety of issues relevant to the field of Asian studies. These were mostly theoretical in nature, sometimes with a practical spin-off. Uh, I will take the liberty of weaving my personal history into the first part of this presentation in an attempt to know what sparked my interest in Asia and how it was sustained over the years in the context of IAS. Every Asian study scholar or practitioner has his or own trajectory of becoming immersed in that bewildering and fascinating space labeled Asia. At a very young age, I read through a fairly big number of comic books called The World in Beeld, The World in View, which I was able to buy at a local drugstore in my native village on the border with Flanders and Zeeland an area fam famous for its flax and textile industry. I was able to buy these issues with the money I earned serving mass in our local Catholic church, at the front of which was an enormous stained <clears throat> glass depicting John the Baptist being baptized in the Jordan River under lush palm trees. Inspired by an issue of World in View on the Crusades, I attempted when I was eight years old to organize a child's crusade, but I failed to garner enough support to realize it. <laughs> Throughout my childhood years, the Catholic rites dictated the life in our village, and the Near East was very much a reality. Asia beyond the Indus River slipped in via this jungle book, which was obligatory reading for members of the scouting. Thus, I learned my first Hindi words, Akela, Bagheera, bungalow, veranda, and cash. My father, a native from Dordrecht, introduced me to an array of Hebrew and Malay words, which over the centuries had become part and parcel of the Dutch language. I was relegated to the boarding school Saint Louis after the use of a substance from Afghanistan. <laughs> the, this school was in Oudenbosch, in the province of Brabant, where we lived in the shadow of a copy of the St. Peter Church in Rome, scale 1 on 10, which was built at the end of the 19th century, and at the boarding school, a copy scale 1 on 50 was built. I came into touch with boys my age from all over the world, including those with Suriname, Indonesian, and Chinese backgrounds, who informally introduced their cultures and languages to us unexpecting country boys. The world which I knew so far, only from books, increasingly became a reality, which further sparked my Far East curiosity. At the end of my boarding school days, we came into touch with a fanatic representative of the Socialist Party, then in its radical infancy. So not before long, I was an avid reader of the Red Book of Chairman Mao and everything else I could find on China sensing its enormous potential. Certainly after reading Alain Pierre Fitt's epoch-making book called La Chine s'éveillera, La Monde tremblera, when China awakens, the world will tremble, written in 1973, which I bought during one of my many visits to Paris where my sister lived. So it came as no surprise that when, when choosing a topic for a final year history essay in 1975, it was entitled China economic superpower in 2000. The history teacher, an open-minded gentleman, jokingly told me that instead of giving me an A minus, he would give me an A if I would change the title into 3000. I refused to do so because the minus could not change the fact that I was already admitted 
to the August Leiden University, the only place where one could study Chinese in the Netherlands. High school days were over. Not many people understood why one would study Chinese. Why such an exotic study? What was I planning to do with it? I soon found out that I could have made my life much easier by, for example, studying law, because those studying it had ample time to engage in partying. <laughs> this, was put out of, this was out of the question for a student Chinese with 20 hours of language lab per week. On top of that, we had to catch up on our knowledge of the Chinese dynastic history, uh, geography, religions, and all other aspects of 5,000 years of Chinese civilization, which was terra incognita for most of us. This all played at the Sinological Institute, which was then housed in the National Museum of Ethnology in Leiden. There, there, there we could also follow a famous course on Budobudorology in a complete Orientalist atmosphere surrounded by stolen artifacts from Asia, now the center of heated debates. My jeunesse doré was over when I was then on the verge of starting my third year Sinology, my father died. As youngest son, I was, asked my, I was asked by my family to help sort out the textile business he left behind. I agreed doing so on the condition that I would work together with my mother towards an orchestrating liquidation of my father's businesses, which consisted of a textile factory and several sales directorships of other companies. Although I had close affinity with the textile world because my father had told me enough about it when he took me with him on business trips uh, to Rotterdam and Paris, he was never able to convince me to follow in his footsteps. The near liquidation took almost five years. The most profitable business, which had paid for the debts my, mothers and I, my mother and I inherited, was sold last. We had a somewhat quasi-monopoly in bicycle bags for newspapers in the Netherlands. These uh, were dispatched to the many newspapers still existing in the Netherlands at that time. We bought the full quote for linen stipulated by the European Union from Pakistan in order to, to produce them. I still vividly uh, remember showing globalized Pakistani businessmen from Karachi around in my native village which much to their surprise resembled the Pakistani ones. So more or less involuntarily stepping in my father's footsteps, nevertheless brought me negotiation skills and MBA in practice, which came in handy in my later life. In the meanwhile, I had stayed enrolled at Leiden University as a history student, which was possible because it was not obligatory to show up in class. So when I told my unexpecting relatives that I managed to do a BNA, BA in history alongside, nobody protested when I used some of the proceeds of our business activities to go to the West in order to go to the East. I got admitted to Middlebury College in Vermont to freshen up my dormant Chinese. The nine weeks intensive course equaled one year of regular study in the Netherlands, but it took hard negotiations to get it homologated. My teacher, who gave me my Chinese name, Wanderwen, freely translated 10,000 virtues out of literature, <laughs> was the famous sinologist Perry Link, who was director of the American Institute at Beijing at the time of the Tiananmen protest. Middlebury College, Ming De Dashui, or Shining Light University, offered a work hard, play hard environment in which everybody both suffered and flourished. The atmosphere was completely in contrast uh, to the culture of mediocrity prevailing at Dutch universities at the time, where the adage was that the sea great suffered. This working hard mentality inspired me, and not before long, I packed my bags and went studying at Tai Dai University in Taipei. The international community of students was in one way or another fascinated by China and Chinese culture. This played around the middle of the 80s of the previous century, and the wind of democratization was blowing freely over Taiwan after the son of President Chiang Kai-shek, nicknamed the Peanut, had left the stage. Nonetheless, 
the, uh, there were still the tension of a possible attack of mainland China. So we had to participate in the monthly exercises of hiding in bomb shelters. And it did not stop me from collecting material for an MA thesis on temple sculptures in Taiwan. At the end of my stay in 1984, I organized together with my sister a trip, a trip um, through mainland China. There were hardly any tourists and our trip was closely monitored by state's representatives. Shanghai was still a bicycle city without cameras monitoring everybody's movements. I was thinking that my Chinese hist or my high history teacher could have been right after all. On my return, without further ado, I wrote an ME thesis on the Royal Dutch Geographical Society and its imperialist activities in the last quarter of the 19th century. I gave up on a second MA in Asian art history because the only professor in that field at the University of Amsterdam went nuts and incommunicado because he spoke a mix of old French, Hakka and a Creole language. He was never replaced and the institute was closed down altogether. In the meanwhile, I had applied for a, schol a scholarship at the Klingendal Institute for the course Foreign Affairs, which was part of the so-called diplomatic class of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. This turned out to be a very intensive three month experience. And before I knew, I found myself in a very nice apartment on the Koninginnegracht in walking distance from Klingendal with its beautiful Japanese garden. I will not go into details of the intensive program, which did not tellingly include any elements having to do with Asia, but will single out the role play of the EU foreign ministers in which I was given the role of Secretary of Foreign Affairs of West Germany. This brought me into contact with the then German ambassador Otto von der Gablenz, who almost single-handedly normalized the relationship between this country and the Netherlands, which before was still strained because of the Second World War. All the ministers involved had to write a telegram, yes, a telegram, to their respective ministries, and I wrote that the unification of Germany should remain the central goal of German foreign policy, and that in the negotiation with the other countries involved, we had managed to bring that goal a step closer. My conclusion met with total disbelief because this was not going to happen in the near future. But lo and behold, four years later, the Berlin Wall fell and the end of history, according to Fukuyama, had arrived. As a bursary, I was automatically admitted to the selection for the diplomatic class in the following year. So I applied, but what to do in the meanwhile? As a deus ex magna, I was invited by the human resource manager of the copy firm O.C. van der Grinten in Venlo. Before I knew, I found myself in a very nice office with a mission to draw up a report on the feasibility of setting up a copy machine factory in Taiwan. Fortunately, I had not only been studying, uh, been studying in Taipei, but had tried my hand at several business ventures relating to the export of flax and car wash machines in Taiwan. DNA proves to be stronger than the mind. The business venture all failed due to the fluctuating rate of the dollar, but also because trade with Taiwan had become overshadowed by the infamous yellow submarine affair. Under pressure of mainland China, what is new, the Dutch government forbade the delivery of the Dutch made submarine to Taiwan, demonstrating the growing influence of Beijing. So what to do? Surely candy would not be offensive to Beijing. So I contacted the producers of Kisses, whom I knew from boarding school days because the factory was situated in Odenbos and took a bus, box of Kisses with me to Taiwan. When I proudly presented it to the candy tycoon in Taipei, he looked at me and said, Shama, what in Chinese? I saw that the beautiful egg white filled chocolate Kisses had become a flattened brown white slurry under the influence of the air pressure in the plane.
So when I recounted this story during a reception of the Dutch representative office in Taipei in the Grand Hotel, everybody had to laugh. And the Dutch representative asked if it would not be better to stick working for OSE. Only later, I found out that he was the one who tipped OSE on this kisses guy. It took me half a year to write up the report and negotiate a good deal for OSE. Setting up a copy machine factory would give it 10 years tax freedom and additional incentives for the construction of the factory and training of personnel. It would be the first factory of such kind in Taiwan because so far these copy machines were primarily produced in Japan and Korea. The transfer of this sensitive technology, what's new again, went under the radar of Beijing. I thought a bright future lay ahead of me, but my dream was shattered by the financial director who had a stake in the representative setup. No hard feelings, he said. Could I draw up a comparable report for the Argentinian market? <laughs> my frank reply was that I was not going to put my life in the service of a copy machine. So back to The Hague and diplomacy, where the ministry and I, in the final selection round, found out that mine and its psychological makeup did not particularly match. <laughs> Fortunately, I had stayed in touch with the history department of my alma mater, which was looking for a young scholar who was willing to bury himself in the National Archive in The Hague to summarize the diaries of the chiefs of the factory of the VUC of the United Dutch East India Company in Nagasaki, Japan. This I got involved in the Deshima Diary Source Publication Project under the leadership of Professor Leonard Blusset, which aimed at making accessible the diaries kept by the chiefs of the Deshima factory from 1641 to 1853, consisting of 35,000 handwritten pages. The only foreign source about Japan during the closed door era. So over the course of five years period, I read, summarized and indexed 20,000 of them written in 17th century Dutch, which was quite hard to decipher, I can promise you. It was a challenge, but at the same time, I had entered a fascinating world and I was on my way becoming a real scholar. This all played against the background of the Institute for the History of the European Expansion and its reactions. Then one of the most lively places of Leiden University. It was a beehive of researchers from all over the world especially Asia, studying modern imperialism and doing research in the National Archive. The title of the first chapter of my book, Deshima Mon Amour, is a reflection of this period. As a source editor, one is bound to unearth a lot of material, new material, but at the same time, one has to refrain from picking all the cherries. The ones I did pick primarily relate to the 18th century spreads of Dutch Western learning or Rangaku in Japan, which laid the basis for the rapid industrial development of Japan during the last quarter of the 19th century. The small group of researchers working in this field had for years tried to find out who had been the Japanese assistant of the German botanist and VOC physician Engelbert Kempfer, whose history of Japan, published in 1727, influenced the Western view on Japan for the next 10, two centuries. In his book, Kempfer described his assistant as follows, and I quote, however, fortune presented me with another opportunity and an instrument in the shape of a learned young man, thanks to whom I could achieve my aims and gather a rich harvest of knowledge. He had to seek out significant information about the state of the country, the government, the court, religion and the history of past ages, family affairs, as well as daily events. There was not a book I endeavored to see which he did not obtain for me, for me and explain and translate the passages indicated." Unquote. By coincidence, I found out who this assistant was. Researchers had in vain looked for his name in the diaries of 1691 and two, these diaries were used by these chiefs as reference works and therefore marginalia summarizing the texts were added. 
only many only many years later one of the chiefs wrote that imamura gelemon Isai had been Kenfer's assistant by that time everyone knew him because of his perfect knowledge of both spoken and written dutch he played a key role in the spread of rangaku in the beginning of the 18th century a period which is often overlooked by historians of japan one of his key works is the book on the art of his horsemanship and breeding for which he received information from a VUC horsemaster who took Persians, ho Persian horses with him to Japan. Also, thanks to him, Kempfer was able to write his history of Japan. Furthermore, this chapter consists of biographical sketches of two persons from my home province, Zeeland. One of them, had a relationship with a woman from a Nagasaki brothel. This as such was not out of the ordinary, but that she erected a graveyard stone for him was a special feat. The only one in existence, by the way. In general, the influence of these so-called housewives of the Dutch is an understudied topic because through their connections with the Dutch traders, most of them became quite wealthy and not only had the profound influence on the economy of the city, but also on the spread of Rangaku, because some of them must have certainly uh, transcended, transcended the usual pillow talk. <clears throat> Let's shift to the second chapter of my book entitled The Colonial Clash. It contains articles on the colonial and imperial war on Taiwan in the 17th century, and on the disastrous effect of missionary activities worldwide. When working at the Institute for the History of the European Expansion and its Reactions, there was a hot debate going on on imperialism in connection with the scramble for Africa, which ended with the Conference of Berlin in 1880, 1885. Because the Dutch had exchanged its only remaining possession in Africa, in present-day Ghana, with the Brits in exchange for the province of Bankulu on Sumatra in 1871, it was generally held by Dutch historians that there was no such thing as Dutch modern imperialism nor any form of Dutch nationalism. I demonstrated that since the outbreak of the Aceh War in 1873, which would last for 30 years, there was an increasingly nationalist and imperialist mood in the Netherlands. It gathered force when imperialism really got globalized as both the United States and Japan joined the race at the end of the 19th century in Asia, threatening the position of the Netherlands East Indies. Furthermore, together with a colleague, Jaap de Moor, we set to work on the re-edition of the works of the 18th century anti-colonialist Jacob Hafner. I ran into him after an Indian textile businessman in Amsterdam, a city which has the biggest Indian population after London, and therefore also is a center of Indian dance, asked me to summarize all what was written on India in the 17th and 18th century in Dutch with the aim of making a movie. I found out that there were some interesting books written about Indian botany and society, but Hafner with his books, Travels in a Palanquin, in India, describing his love story with an Indian temple dancer called Mine and the Businessman's Eye. Without further ado, he ordered a script to be written, uh, but nothing came of it. Then we got the idea of publishing his five travel stories in the series of the Lindschote Vereniging, which is comparable to the British Hackloid Society. The previous volumes of the series were filled, save a couple of exceptions, with tedious, repetitive ship voyage stories. The cover of our book was in color, which was a re revolution for the Sea Date Society. The first volume was presented at the Literary Museum in The Hague, and it sold out in no time. We did follow the Society's strict academic rules, which resulted in an edited and annotated edition in three volumes, whereas a scholar of the Kern Institute for Indian Studies helped us out with it many Tamil and Hindi words Hafner used in his works. Unfortunately, this institute closed down. Its library was moved to the Leiden University Library, as would, would all other collect, all Asian collections kept by now defunct institutes. 
This development was crowned with the opening of the Asia Library in 2018, certainly one of the jewels of Leiden University. We separately added Hafner's essay against missionaries and missionary societies that stood in an at that time almost completely forgotten tradition of writers who were highly critical, critical of the Western expansion overseas. The Hafner research triggered my interest in biography, but this was a historical genre which was quite unpopular and looked down upon in the Netherlands. Historians were more interested in economic or social history, and the dry, in crowd articles they wrote didn't have much of a circulation nor an audience. With the slogan, an historian is someone with a helicopter, helicopter vision, nowadays one would say drone vision, building on our newly founded, founded organization, the Historis Platform, historical platform, a group of young historians try to change the general conception of a historian specialized in a certain time period and era into one of a generalist employable in all strata of society. A lot of the historians could not find work at that time. With the present king and prime minister of the Netherlands being historians, that mission was successful, not in the least of the enormous PR generated by the historic news blood, the historic newspaper, which shook up the sleepy historical academic world due to its journalistic nature, reporting on what's happening in the field of research, interview with authors, reviews with, of books, and so on. The historical platform also founded the Historical Biograph Biography Committee with the aim of actively stimulating biography writing. It organized the first day of the historical biography in 1992. My contribution was entitled, Who is Afraid of the Historical Biography? Which is a nonsensical question in the English or Chinese language realm, but as said, the Netherlands never had a vibrant tradition. In the edited volume of papers, I also contributed an article on the Asia and African scholar P.A. Vett, who caught my eye when writing my ME thesis about the Royal Dutch Geographical Society of which he was the president. Fett was a popularizer of Indonesia and Indonesian studies, which, which archipelago very much became part of Dutch identity at the end of the 19th century, exemplified in the saying, in this lost disastrous cost. By the time my biography about him was published in 2000, biography had become an increasingly popular genre in the Netherlands, while by now, there is a redundance of biography writing. Since most of the contents of the remaining four chapters is connected to IAS, I will briefly sketch how it came about. Asian studies at the beginning of the 90s of the previous century had reached rock bottom in Europe and the Netherlands in particular. In 1989, the Institute for Asian Art, Hist Art at the University of Amsterdam was forced to close down the, the professor who turned nuts was never replaced, mm -hmm. which led to the severe image damage, damage. Time for action. A committee headed by the Berkeley professor, Fritz Stahl, produced the report, Baby Krishna, which was still pretty much language and post-Orientalist driven. Nevertheless, one of the recommendations of the report was, put in place, uh, was to put in place a committee for the social sciences. Its report, Baby Krishna in the Delta was much more social studies and contemporary in nature. Both reports made a strong plea for the foundation of a European Institute for Asian Studies, which should be in the Netherlands. This after sounding out colleagues in France, Germany, and England, who agreed that Netherlands was neutral grounds with a long-standing Asian studies tradition. Ministry of Education subsidized the Institute for a non-defined numbers of years and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs added the two-year internationalization budget. With this, the Institute was founded in 1993 and was off to a flying start. However, the Institute was named International Institute for Asian Studies and not European because that would have been too limited in view, too limiting in view of the task 
it said itself. Asian studies in Europe was still quite Orientalist in outlook, and the founding director of the Institute, Wim Stockhoff, understood that stressing contemporary Asian studies in the Institute's outlook was tantamount to realize the ambition to become a facilitator for Asian studies worldwide. I must admit that I'm not found fond of teaching, and therefore I knew that a traditional career in academia was not in store for me. When it was rumored that a new institute in the field of Asian studies was looking for an editor, I did not hesitate. I knocked at the door of the director and he asked what the reason of my visit was. I replied that I just wanted to check out the place, whereupon he asked what I thought of it. I said, I like the idea. So we are accepted, he ironically said, but edit, submit your CV this evening and let's talk tomorrow. One of the reasons why I was chosen was my experience in PR and as an editor of periodicals. The director who was all in favor of a newsletter in newspaper format only had to convince the board that this was a good idea. It was not easy, also in view of the fairly big budget that, uh, uh, that was allocated for it, because, because could that not be better be used to fund scholars? The board grudgingly agreed. We were all gripped by the vibe of setting up a new innovative institute. We all worked overtime. The directorate managed, established contacts throughout Europe, resulting in the European Alliance for Asian Studies, which over the years expanded and now has 20 members. He and his executive secretary, Sabine Kuipers, and later on Manon Osseweyer, Josien Stremelaar, and Willem Vogelsang, were able to successfully establish contacts with a variety of institutes and organizations throughout Asia, set up research programs with teams ranging from changing labor relations in Asia to performing arts in Asia, and attracted talented fellows to join the ranks of IAS, who were given the opportunity to present their research results at the annual meetings of the Association for Asian Studies, then the biggest meeting worldwide. The first time we went to the AAS annual meeting was in Washington in 1995, where IAS had rented the booth in the exhibition hall to publicize the then fledgling IAS and its IAS newsletter. Apart from a pile with 1,500 newsletter and a ditto amount with linen IAS bags, which would become an IAS signature giveaway, we did not have much to show for, for, but at the end of the meeting, everybody had a bag and the newsletter. We were clearly the new kid on the block. And the newsletter quickly established itself as a well-read communication channel in the fragmented field of Asian studies. From then on, IES has always been present at those annual meetings with two to five boots. I was tasked to further explore the possibilities of cooperation with the US Asian Studies superpower. In 1996, I visited the AAS Secretariat in Ann Arbor to further explore the possibilities of cooperation between AAS and IAS. I had long talks with John Campbell, Secretary Treasurer of the AAS. By that time, I could present him with a preliminary edition of the Guide to Asian Studies in Europe from which it transpired that the number of Asia scholars in Europe was at the same level as in the States combined. Now he knew, uh, now he knew whom to call in Europe and he agreed, so Dijon agreed to, to assist us in organizing the first edition of the International Convention of Asia Scholars, ICAS, which IAS had just conceived with the aim to further internationalize Asian studies. We learned a lot at the AAS meetings, what to do and certainly what not to do. We admired the flawless organization of such a big conference, but also noticed that the meeting was quite parochial in nature, that there were only a few non-US scholars, and furthermore, it was organized along regional and disciplinary lines, and it took place in a big chain hotel where nothing reminded of Asia. Our approach would be different, but I will come back to that later. 
IS in its first deca decade of its existence was closely connected to diplomatic and ministerial circles. It held yearly meetings for all Asian ambassadors residing in the Netherlands, at which ministers of foreign affairs and EU commissioners talked about their Asia policies. By now, the very end of the previous century, Asia was seen as, a vi as vital for both EU foreign policy and the economic welfare of Europe. Chapter four, the post-colonial meeting of Asia and Europe, and chapter five, the Eurasian space, pertain to political developments between Asia and Europe in the period from 1995 to 2010. After decolonization, interest in relations between Asia and Europe was minimal. A marked upsurge in interest on this topic became noticeable as awareness grew both in Asia and Europe of the necessity of improving relations between those two continents. IAS was very much involved in the so-called Asia-Europe meeting ASEM process. Initiators of the rapprochement between Asia and Europe were the French and Singapore governments. The Prime Minister of Singapore, Go Chok Tong, visited the IAS in 1995 and asked if it wanted to be actively involved from the academic side in what was coined the Asia-Europe meeting process or the rapprochement between Asia and Europe. This was itself the outcome of several preparatory meetings between Asian and European resource persons, notably the Asia-Europe Forum in Venice and Manila in 1996, and the first meeting of ASEM took place in Bangkok under the theme New Comprehensive Asia-Europe Partnership for Greater Growth. One of these decisions was to found the Asia-Europe Foundation, ASEF, which acted as a secretariat to steer the process. While the secretariat was primarily busy organizing the ever expanding meetings of ASEM, we found out that none of the outcomes or articles written about it were structured by ASEF. So IAS founded the ASEM research platform, platform which gathered all information and declarations on, on ASEM. In two years, this platform became well known to all those interested in the process, which included journalists, scholars, artists, diplomats, politicians, NGO and civil society, civil society representatives, and so on. Open and lively discussions took place, and it was truly a multi-stakeholder dialogue on Asia and Europe relationships. Unfortunately, the platform ran out of budget, and therefore it was decided to hand over all the information gathered to ASEF. Only the library and the agenda part of the pl platform were kept online because due to political pressure from some countries, there was no longer a place for truly open discussions. Most of the articles in these two chapters, which were co-written with colleagues in the field, such as Wim Stockhoff, Sebastian Berzik, and Yeo Lai Hui, emphasize the point that it is vitally important to strengthen the ASEM process, not only for its own sake, but more importantly, in order to create a strong and stable global triangular relationship for the 21st century, in which Asia, the United States, and Europe form the pillars. ASEF, in cooperation with the European Alliance for Asian Studies, of which IAS has a secretariat, in the first decade of this century, organized ASEM workshops in which scholars from Asia and Europe were brought together to discuss issues relevant to Asia and Europe. It all culminated in the Europe-Asia Policy Forum, in which IAS, ASEF, the Singapore Institute for Foreign Relations, and the Brussels-based European Institute for Asian Studies cooperated. The European Commission gave a very generous grant for a three-year period from 2009 to 2011. It organized Brussels briefings on topical issues pertaining to Asia, to the Asia-Europe relationships and roundtables on conflict management, development and in regional integration in both regions and the environment and sustainable development. The interest in this relationship waned in the second decade of the century, but recent developments in the political and economic sphere have brought the relationship between Asia and Europe once more center stage. 
chapter six, Asian studies for the 21st century, and chapter seven, the International Convention of Asia Scholars, zoom in on Asian studies per se, and span the period from 1993 until now. Globalization was the buzzword in the 1990s, which together with the concomitant IT revolution, enormously facilitated communication, which made Asian studies into a global network. ICAS was conceived as a border transcending multidisciplinary transregional concept with presenters from all over the world. The selection committee of ICAS-1 in 1998 consisted of representatives of all AAS regional council and members of the regional European Asian studies organizations. About 1000 participants and visitors came to Leiden. Practically all elements which are still characteristic of ICAS today were already in place at ICAS-1, such as an Asia exhibition, Asia film festival, dance, music performances, and so on. At ICAS-2 in Berlin, the ICAS secretariat was officially founded, and it was decided that ICAS, for obvious reasons, should have its meetings in Asia. ICAS-3 was organized in Singapore in cooperation with the local partner, the National University of Singapore. Partnering with a local university or universities would become the format, format for all future ICAS editions. The selection of panels organized by academicians was primarily done by Asian scholars from these universities, while the ICAS secretariat organized the individual proposal along thematic lines that led to unusual topical combinations, which in turn created the so-called ICAS vibe. This vibe brought numerous new initiatives into being. Subsequent meetings were held in Shanghai, Kuala Lumpur, and Daejeon. Cooperation between AES and IAS ICAS reached new heights with its joint meeting in Honolulu in 2011. With 800 panels, roundtables, and workshops addressing a wide range of topics and issues, as well as exhibits, a video program, music and theater performances, business meetings, receptions, and other social functions. It was the biggest Asian studies meeting so far. For the first time, 50% of the 5,000 participants were Asia scholars from Asia itself. It was a clear signal to the outside world that Asian studies are very much alive. Further editions of ICAS were in Macau, Chiang Mai, Adelaide, Leiden, and the Kyoto online one in 2021. For those who do not know as yet, the 13th edition of ICAS will take place in Surabaya at the end of July of next year. In the course of its existence, ICAS counts many spin-offs. First of all, the ICAS book series, which were the outcome of the hundreds of papers submitted for ICAS, which after selection process were published in thematical volumes. The sheer volume of articles was at a certain time too much to handle, and, and therefore it was discontinued, but now it has been revived with an open edition in 2022. Just as ICAS, uh, just as ICAS its book price has a trans-regional character and is split up into a humanities and social science section, which is mirrored in the English language edition for dissertations. Over the years, this prize has grown into a multilingual prize with eight language editions, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and German, so as to unlock the accumulated knowledge in these language traditions. These are sponsored by Asian Studies Institutes worldwide, and the English edition has already for a long time been sponsored by Leiden University Library. For the ninth edition in 2019, more than a thousand titles were submitted, including an experiment with articles on Hong Kong. Related to the IBP is the ICAS book presentation carousel, which offers both young doctors and authors of books in other languages than English, the opportunity to present them. The IBP, now in its 10th edition, 
has over the years been a mirror of developments in the field of Asian studies. I will pick out one telling one, one telling trend. Whereas in the beginning, the contribution of Asian authors hovered around 15%. Now in its 10th editions, more than 50% of the authors are from Asia. Sorry. Present IAS director Philip Pécan, together with scholars from A Africa, developed the idea of an Africa Asia conference entitled A New Access of Knowledge, which is an inclusive transnational platform that convenes scholars, educators, and artists from all continents to study and discuss and share knowledge on the intricate connections between African and Asian world. The ICAS model was used to organize these conferences with universities in Accra and Dar es Salaam as local hosts. Incidentally, also an Africa-Asia book prize was set up by the ICAS Secretariat using the model of the ICAS book prize. At this very moment, a deputation of IAS are following this meeting from Dakar. So I wish Martina, Y, Erika and Philippe Lots of success in the negotiations, which should lead up to the third edition of Africa Asia at the beginning of 2025. I see it's time to move to the Q&A session, section of this book presentation. Before I hand the floor over to you, I just want to say a few closing words. As could be gleaned from my personal history, one develops interest in a, in a topic by a succession of coincidences, which tend to reinform, reinforce a trend in a certain direction. And before one realize, rises, one is at the end of a career in a certain field, in my case, Asian studies. Bob Hefner, in his blurb on the back cover of my book, pinpoints how I have experienced my trip as one, and I quote, from colonial instrumentality to cross-cultural celebration, unquote. Today, the question, why study Asia, is seldom hear, heard. If you look around you, you will notice that Asia has become part and parcel of the makeup of our global village and is everywhere. It is a pity that nowadays Asia, China more in particular, is construed at all levels of Western society be it at the political, the economical, or the university level, as a threat. The yellow danger concocted at, in the 19th century by the West is back with a vengeance. Severing ties with our Chinese or Russian colleagues in the humanities and social sciences would be a very foolish thing to do. I firmly believe that cross-pollination of knowledge at local, regional, and transnational levels will free up suppressed knowledge to craft a global future, a cross-cultural celebration in instead of a chat GPT-generated one. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>